So um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Francesco Marchetti. I'm a PhD student at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. And today I will talk about the inclusive genetic programming, which is a new genetic programming heuristic that uh, we have developed in the past months. My talk will start with a quick introduction on the aim and the background of this work and on the diversity promotion and maintenance issue. Then I'll describe you the inclusive evolutionary process, which is at the core of the inclusive genetic programming. And after that, I'll show you the obtained results through a comparison with the dose obtained using a standard implementation of the genetic programming. And finally, I wrap up with the inferred conclusion and the future work directions. Now, before starting, I'd like to describe you a bit of the background behind this work so you can better understand what led to the development of the inclusive GP. The, the IGP was originally formulated to solve a control problem. In particular, we wanted to find a control law for a space access vehicle. And for this kind of problem, it was noted that more complex models, so bigger individuals, led to better solutions, which were able to deal more efficiently with the nonlinearities of the problem. Because of that, we tried to modify the GP so to maintain and promote the population diversity, so to avoid losing bigger individuals due to the bloat control operators, and also to consider them during the evolutionary process, even if they had poor performances. So with this work, we want to further investigate this new GP heuristic by testing it on pure symbolic regression tasks and comparing it with uh, a standard implementation of GP. This with the goal to positively contribute uh, towards the open issue of diversity promotion and maintenance in uh, genetic programming. The, the topic of diversity promotion and maintenance is well known in the literature and was analyzed by several researchers in the past, but unfortunately no common and definitive approach is, is used to address it. And dealing with the population diversity is important since a more diverse population boosts the exploratory power while having more similar individuals can help during the exploitation phase. Among the different techniques used to address this issue, there are uh, niching methods and IGP can be classified as one of them. There are some differences though in comparison to classical niching approaches. In fact, as described by Shear, niching methods are usually used to find multiple optima in a multimodal optimization by parallel evolving the different niches towards different optima. In the IGP, the niches are not isolated and are used during the whole evolutionary process so to consider all the individuals in the population and from here, the term inclusive. In fact, as depicted in the picture below, the goal is to have a flow of genes between the different niches, so to avoid losing well-performing genes contained in a globally poor-performing individual. And the way these niches are created is based on, a, on the genotypic diversity of the individuals, which is their length, as I'll explain better in the next slides. But um, the subdivision can be done also in other ways, for example, based on the phenotypic diversity, which is the fitness of the individuals. Now, uh, regarding the inclusive evolutionary process, it is based on a modified version of the Mu-plus lambda evolutionary strategy, which uh, with this evolutionary strategy, the process starts with uh, Mu individuals, then lambda individuals are produced during the mating phase, where lambda is usually bigger than Mu, and um, finally, Mu individuals are selected by the selection operators. Compared to the original version, the inclusive Mu-plus lambda possesses three main differences. First, the population is divided into niches, and these are created before the inclusive reproduction and the inclusive selection are performed. And the inclusive reproduction and selection are the other two main changes. About the niches creation mechanism, as I said, the individuals are distributed according to their length, so the number of nodes inside each individual, which is their genotype. Considering the example in the picture, we have a population composed by 10 individuals. Uh, and if we don't consider the root node, we have a minimum length of one and a maximum of eight. And we want to create 10 niches. So the individuals will be distributed as you can see in the picture. The first niche will contain the individuals with a length from one to 1.7, the second those with a length from 1.7 to 2.4 and so on. Now, during the evolutionary process, the number of niches is kept constant, but the individuals inside them and the length span that they cover changes. Already without considering the reproduction and selection, this creates a flow of genes between niches since uh, their variation of size allows for the shifting of individuals between contiguous niches. Coming to the inclusive reproduction, it works in, in the following way. Considering the previous, the previous example, the reproduction process starts selecting the reproduction operation to perform according to the assigned probability. In this case, it starts with the crossover 
represented by the uh, yellow boxes and selects two niches from the list of the available niches that you can see on top. Considering these two niches, the best individual is chosen from the first one and the random individual is chosen from the second one. And then these individuals are combined with a one point crossover operator. The selection of the best individual from the first niche and the random one from the second niche is done to maintain the diversity of the population and to avoid losing good performing uh, individuals. Then the process continues, crossover is selected again, two niches are selected from the list of the available niches and crossover is performed. By proceeding in the process, the list of the available niches is updated by removing the niches already selected from it. Now mutation is selected and the random individual is picked from the chosen niche. The individual is selected randomly since it is not guaranteed that applying mutation to the best performing one uh, leads to better results. <coughs> Uh, the list of the available niches then is updated again and the process continues. Uh, the same reasoning is applied when the one-to-one -one reproduction is selected, when, where one-to-one -one reproduction means that the individual is passed unaltered to the offspring. Now, when all the niches are selected, uh, the list of uh, the available niches is reset to its initial state and the process goes on until lambda individuals are produced. Two other features that are implemented in the IGP are um, dynamic change of the crossover and mutation rates and the fitness check of the individuals chosen for crossover. About the dynamic rates, the process starts with a, a high mutation rate and a low crossover rate, and they are respectively decreased and increased as the process goes on. This is done to promote exploration at the beginning of the evolutionary process and exploitation towards the end. Regarding the fitness check, it is performed on the individuals chosen for crossover to avoid uh, combining individuals with the same behavior. So if two individuals with the same fitness values are selected for crossover, the niche selection is, uh, is repeated until two different individuals are selected. Finally, the inclusive tournament is the last piece of the IGP and it works in a very straightforward way. The niches are selected in a sequential manner and on each niche, a double tournament selection is applied. The double tournament was chosen as selection mechanism since it works also as an indirect bloat control operator. In fact, it works by selecting either the best individual or the smaller one according to, the, to a probability value from a pool of, of randomly chosen individuals. The arrow in the picture indicates the selected niche and the green box, the individual which was selected. This process goes on until more individuals are selected and the key feature of this process is that each niche can be selected at most t times, where t is the number of individuals inside it. This is done to reduce the probability of having clones of the same individual in the population. So, for example, the process starts and selects an individual from the first niche, then the second, and so on. When all the niches are selected, the process starts again and we select individuals from the first, the second, but not the third one, since at most one individual can be selected from that niche. Another feature of the inclusive tournament is the ability to deal with constraints. And although this feature wasn't used in this work, the inclusive tournament is designed in a way that uh, can handle at least two fitness functions, where the second is the result of, a, of the total constraints violation. In this way, the selection mechanism favors first those individuals that satisfy the imposed constraints and then looks for the best behaving ones. To test this uh, new heuristic, we decided to use nine different benchmarks taken from the literature. Five of them are from synthetic functions and four of them are from real world data. These are listed in the tables uh, on the left, while on the right is listed how the data were sampled for the synthetic benchmarks. Regarding the notation used in uh, table three, looking at the benchmarks COSA1, 20 random points were sampled uniformly between minus one and one. While looking at the benchmark, benchmark S1, the data were sampled between minus 0 0.5 and 10.5 with a spacing between the points of 0 0.1. So that is the meaning of U and uh, E that you can see in the table. To assess the improvements given by the AGP, we compared it with the classical GP formulation, which uh, we referred as SGP. They were set, as you can see in this table, and the goal was to set them in the most similar way, so to be able to isolate only the benefits introduced by the new modifications. They were both coded in Python, relying on the open source library DEEP, and the developed code is open source and can be found at the link that you can see here. 
About these settings, a uh, population of 300 individuals was used for 300 generations. Then, as I was saying before, for the AGP, the mutation rate starts at 0 0.8 and the crossover one starts at 0 0.2. Then they are changed until the mutation rate becomes 0 0.2 and the crossover 0 0.8. This mechanism was tested on the SGP, but it didn't le lead to any significant difference. So we decided to keep the mutation and crossover rates fixed for the SGP. <coughs> Both the, the SGP and the SGP are based on the evolutionary strategy Mu plus Lambda. So Lambda offspring is generated and then Mu individuals are selected from a population composed by parents and offspring. Limit height and size are used by the blood control operator, which is the one implemented in the deep library, which uh, it works in, in the following way. When an, in, uh, sorry, when an invalid child is generated, so with the depth or number of nodes above the limit, it is simply replaced by one of its parents randomly selected. Then for the SGP, a double tournament selection was used. And about the mutation operator, for both algorithms, more types of mutation operation could be selected among those that you can see in the table, with a probability of being selected as reported in the, the brackets near them. About the use primitives, add free and mul free are respectively a ternary addition and multiplication, while pxp and plog are exponential L and the logarithm functions modified to avoid numerical errors. Finally, for both the GP algorithms, the fitness was measured using the root mean square error. <clears throat> Now, starting from the synthetic benchmarks, these are the results. This plot represents the median value and standard deviation of the root mean square error on the fitness and the entropy during the evolutionary process. To obtain the median and standard deviation, each benchmark was simulated 100 times. Now, looking at the root mean square error, it is clear how the AGP always outperformed the SGP by converging to lower values. And about the entropy, it was used to measure the population diversity during the evolutionary process. And it's evaluated, as you can see on the right, where D is the distribution of the individuals across the different niches without considering the empty ones. And uh, the distribution represents the percentage of individuals inside each niche. For the sake of this comparison, the niches were created also in the SGP to evaluate the entropy, but of course they weren't used. So from these results, it can be seen how the IGP is able to maintain the population's entropy, so its diversity, approximately constant and uh, at a high value throughout the process, while in the SGP, it tends to diminish towards the end, meaning that diversity is lost during the process. In fact, a high value of the entropy means a more diverse population. So this proves that promoting and maintaining the population's diversity helps to improve the results. Then we also tested the best individuals for each one of the 100 simulation on both train and test data. And thus in this comparison, the IGP performs better than the SGP. Hence, it also possesses better generalization capabilities. The, the only exception is on the COSA1 benchmark, where the SGP performs slightly better than the, the IGP. And uh, the exact reason of this behavior is unclear, but uh, we think that this could be due to the fact that the AGP tends to have bigger individuals than the SGP, which for such simple benchmark could be uh, overkill solutions and then perform worse than the simpler individuals produced by the, the SGP. The same trend is observable on the real world benchmarks, both from the fitness and the entropy and entropy perspectives. So also here you can see that the AGP converges to lower values and that the entropy is maintained uh, approximately constant and a high value throughout the evolutionary process. And again, also when testing the best individuals on training and test data, IGP performs better than the SGP. So to wrap up, we developed a novel genetic programming heuristic based on a niching mechanism to promote and maintain the population diversity during the evolutionary process. We have proved that it performs better than a standard genetic programming implementation, both in terms of convergence and results on training and test data. The importance of uh, the population diversity was measured using, during the, uh, sorry, using the entropy, and we've seen how, when keeping it constant, the results improve. A natural way forward for this work would be to apply this heuristic also on other genetic programming formulations, like the multi-gene genetic programming to see if it helps or not. And then comparing it with, the, for example, GPDIPS, which is one of the state-of-the-art algorithm for genetic programming. And also 
to be nice to combine our approach with other diversity maintenance strategies to further increase the obtained benefits. So thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you like the presentation and I'm happy to answer any question you might have. Thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you for the clarity of the presentation. Uh, let's see if there is any question. Um, I'm not seeing questions. Uh, so uh, I have one question. I, I, um, um, I see that you uh, employ a sort of auto adaptation mechanism for some for some of the parameters. Um, do, do you think this is uh, working just with this kind of diversity promotion mechanism, or could it be uh, extended to other diversity promotion promotion mechanisms? Yeah, I I think it could be used also on other mechanisms. Um, here it was helpful because. Um, by dividing the individuals on their uh, length, basically. Uh, if we promoted the uh, mutation at the beginning, we, we had more possibility to create uh, more different and so bigger or smaller individuals. And so we could have like a much more different population uh, at the beginning of the evolutionary process. But of course, this could be applied also to, to other mechanisms. I mean, in general, mutation can be very helpful, but uh, for the exploration phase, because if you only rely on mutation, then you will will not converge to any good results, basically. So yeah, I think that also in general, a good balance between the two and a mutation of these rates could, could be helpful. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, we have a um, uh, lot of time for further question concerning this work and maybe also previous works if you think some question has not been done uh, in the previous break uh, because the next speaker is scheduled to, to be at uh, a quarter past uh, four. Okay, I see that there is another question from Bill. Bill, please. Um, well, sorry, I, I don't want to monopolize it, but um, it did occur to me that the measure of diversity seemed to be very, um, very strict. You were just looking at the size of the trees. And there seem to be lots of other ways of which you could look at um, the genetic material inside the trees um, as a way of, of preserving um, diversity of the genetic material. Or you could look at um, diversity as, as being measured by some measure of the performance of the individual. So, um, something like looking at, do they perform well on different um, test examples? So there seem to be lots, that, lots of other ways that the, the work could be expanded. Yeah, yeah, you are uh, definitely right. And um, especially as I was saying in the conclusion, um, when talking about the multi-gene genetic programming, we did some testing on it to see if this approach could work on that. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't work as good as with the normal genetic programming. And these, I, I think this is due to the fact that with multi-gene, you have uh, an individual composed by multiple trees. So it is more difficult to divide the, the individuals according to the length because uh, they would end up uh, approximately with the same uh, mean length, more or less. Uh, because of the mm -hmm. fact that they have multiple individuals inside them. So using different diversity measures could be helpful in that case to differentiate in a better way as the individuals. So again, in your introduction, you talked about preserving different types of genes. And, and what we've actually done is preserve different, type, uh, different size programs. So we haven't looked at the genes within those programs at all. Yeah, not, uh, not directly. Uh, the idea was that um, by preserving that basically, you know, bigger, bigger individuals, bigger trees could help, could have uh, uh, also good genes inside them. Also, if they perform poorly globally, like just mm -hmm. small snippets, snippets. So the, the global idea was to preserve those individuals, which could have 
these genes uh, and uh, keep them during the evolutionary process. But yeah, we didn't uh, check uh, thoroughly the, the genes inside each of the, the individuals. But if, if we just do it on the basis of size, then, then it seems very similar to the, the approaches that people have used on bloat control. Where, where programs are divided according to their size and kept in, in, in um, uh, different pins according to size. I, th I think Sarah Silver did, did some work on that, um, Steve Deegan. Um, but so that, that looking at the genetic material would, would seem fairly straightforward, but the, you could also look at the, the, the um, phenotypic material. Yep. If, um, and again, that, that might be a way of preserve, uh, usefully preserving diversity. Uh, one of the things in, in GP is that the, the trees tend to be all different, but it's actually making the difference just between them useful is, uh, seems more tricky. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I was also reading recently a work about um, uh, good diversity and bad diversity, since not all the diversity can be useful or not, as you said. So yeah, there's uh, there are several ways to to improve the work that we did. Yeah, Th thank you very much for the feedback. <laughs>